So I'm Hart, and today we have an excellent panel for you about the coming multi-chain world, uh, technologies and use cases for connecting blockchain networks. Uh, and we have some fantastic experts on our panel, uh, including Sophia from Kaleido, who's done a lot of work with the Firefly project. Uh, Shingo from Fujitsu, who's one of the founders and uh, former lead maintainers of the Cacti project. Uh, and Susumu, who's worked with the Yui project and is a maintainer there. Um, so we have an excellent crew together for you today. Um, so out of curiosity, how many people are familiar with blockchain? Some. And how many are familiar with blockchain interoperability or connections or, or like cross-chain transactions, atomic swaps, stuff like that? I see Rai raising his hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's great. Um, so we have a little bit of background information planned. Uh, we'll let our panelists introduce themselves and discuss some basic background on uh, Hyperledger and interoperability within Hyperledger. Uh, and then I will ask them a bunch of questions uh, and give you the opportunity to ask them questions as well. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Sophia Lopez. Thanks, Hart. I guess I'll try using this okay. mic. So, all right. So, um, we met as a panel and thought we would start with a couple of introductory concepts and slides. Well, first, um, just to explain what Hyperledger is, and actually, I might not be the best person to do the intro. There are some uh, more qualified people who are on the Hyperledger Foundation team. But I can give the perspective of an industry participant and collaborator, um, so hopefully that's valuable to you all as well. So it's a global cross-industry consortium of communities collaborating and advancing business blockchain technologies. What's uh, great about Hyperledger is that it leads with code. So you actually you get the code base, engineers and developers can find it, they can start using it and applying it. There are other blockchain communities that lead with standards, and then there that uh, it's a, a different approach. Um, so you can see what works best for for your companies. So what makes the Hyperledger Foundation unique? So it's hosted by the Linux Foundation. We were some of us are actually at the global summit that Hyperledger hosts, and it was in Dublin this year. And we had uh, the privilege to hear someone, a luminary from the Linux Foundation speak, who shared that 90% of all enterprise open source code in production actually sits in the Linux Foundation. So uh, it really is the home for production grade open source. And there's a lot of investment on topics like security and compliance and, and what enterprises really need to be able to, to run this at scale and in production. It's neutral and collaborative, so it's always open to all who wish to participate. And it is looking at standards by business and for business. So looking at key enterprise requirements. And today we'll be talking about interop and hybrid blockchains, but there's certainly a lot of other considerations around privacy, scale, performance, um, and the like. So uh, it is the, a community where blockchain uh, software is contributed and maintained. And uh, Hyperledger does not run blockchains. Those are done through separate entities, foundations, and um, obviously global organizations and companies. Then uh, they certainly aim to be a diverse community. Anyone can join, and there's no pay to play so that if people feel strongly about contributing to a community and participating, it's open to everyone, uh, as well as the meetings, email lists, and communities. So certainly encourage everyone who's interested in learning more about blockchain, digital assets, Web3, to take a look at Hyperledger. And I think this might be one of the, one of the last slides on Hyperledger. Um, so it started in 2015 and actually launched with a couple of key contributions from various companies across the industry. Actually, back then, I was on the IBM side of things, and um, we, were, we were pretty active. And um, I, I actually had responsibility of launching the IBM blockchain platform and the open source developer team that worked on the Fabric code, so it was great looking at the life cycle of all these projects that were contributed since then, 
And as Kaleido, we've sort of come full circle and have been become very active in other projects, and one of them, um, Firefly, which we'll talk, I'll talk about later today as well. And then you could see some of the other projects here, such as Cactus is represented by Shingo. And then there's certainly a, a number of labs as well. You could see towards the bottom, and Yui sits with the labs that Sus Susumo is going to speak about. So certainly Hyperledger looks to address a diverse ecosystem of enterprise tech and use cases, and that's across industries, and, and some of these cut horizontally as well as, as vertically. So a lot of really exciting work being done using um, blockchain digital asset technologies. I know some people in the audience said they're not as familiar with blockchain. So um, if you look across all of these use cases, there, there really is a common denominator of a shared data problem. So you have multiple participants that could sit across an industry, and they really need to get that one common view of the data. And a shared ledger provides that. And of course, the cryptography and immutability means you could trust it. So if you have people who might be competitors in some sense but are collaborating to drive down costs, if it's a supply chain, or even a new industry ecosystems and models. Um, they know this is trusted shared data and shared application logic that they can collaborate with. And certainly there's a lot of use cases around new types of digital assets, tokens, NFTs, that have become quite interesting as well to companies that might not be as much of an ecosystem approach, but just a, a new business model or a new way to engage with your consumers. So uh, on the educational side of things, um, we did put in a couple slides just to talk about, before getting into more advanced topics of blockchain interoperability and hybrid blockchains, just talking about the different types of blockchains that companies might engage with. And there certainly are a spectrum. A lot of, te a lot of times people think about it as um, private, more on the enterprise side, and then the public community where, where you can see crypto and, and other applications of the technology. Over time, over the last seven years, we've seen that the private permission blockchains have really looked to do more and more where they can tap into public ecosystems. And the public projects have looked more to add things like app chains or subnets where they can have more scalability, more performance, and various types of primacy. But as you can see, on the permission is public. It's really you're looking at more of crypto. Then you can move across the continuum, you know, all the way to some place um, on the right-hand side where you have medical records, where it's very compliant, regulated. You have uh, personally identifiable information. Then another slide we wanted to put in just from set some definitions. You know, when people say interoperability, it can mean a lot of things. So if you look at just the operational dimensions of interacting with core systems and sources of data. I mean, there's certainly, you need to interoperate between the new sort of blockchain-based ledgers and digital assets with non-DLT or non-distributed ledger technology systems. So how do you get data in and out your core systems and sources of data that's being exchanged with your blockchain-based work? And, you know, increasingly, obviously, you know, the industry has moved towards sort of cloud-delivered, events-driven type architectures where you, know, you can listen to events and send event events back and forth. So you um, have transactions happening on the ledger, and then they get picked up, and you can interoperate with your core systems through standard RESTful APIs. Now, the next hop over, you see interop between, you know, within a DLT network. So you could have you know, a Hyperledger BESU or Ethereum-based network, and you could have various ledgers with um, smart contracts, SC stands for smart contract, within the same DLT network. Then the ne next hop, you can have different networks, but still using the same underlying protocol. And then I would say the most you know, advanced case, which some of the projects we're talking about today, really look at um, interoperating between different types of blockchain protocols. So, um, you know, a lot of standard ones in the enterprise space. You have Ethereum variants, and Hyperledger best who sits in the Hyperledger community. Then there's Hyperledger Fabrics, another popular uh, type of DLT technology. And then another one that enterprises often um, will consider as a third option as well is Corda. 
Corda-based, and that um, does not sit in the Hyperledger community. Um, and then there are hundreds of public protocols, and a lot of those have a token associated with them, and those, those sit on the public side of things. But increasingly, on getting to the next definition, we see people looking to interoperate between public and private. So, um, you know, that's more commonly when people say hybrid would uh, refer to that. And why would they do that? Um, so we're finding that in some cases, let's say you're a gaming company and you have users who interact with in-game assets. Increasingly, they're representing those as non-fungible tokens or NFTs. So if you're a gaming company and you have millions of users and transactions daily, you, you're, they're, they're telling us they're looking for doing that on a gas-free chain. So public ecosystems have a token and it costs money to transact. For a lot of these high volume transactions, they basically want what's a side chain or their own internal chain. So they have more predictable transaction and performance throughput and no need to hold crypto and it's gas free. But then there could be that special sword or the thing you win in the game that you want to exit as an NFT to a public marketplace because now it's worth a lot of money and your users might want to also just take it to another game ecosystem. So you need to be able to have lots of gas-free transactions, some potentially like layer two, they're called, um, which are low cost, and then some that could be very high cost, but for very high value assets. And um, that gets us to one of our final definitional type concepts, which is just this layer one, which is the original protocols that are you know, sometimes called mainnets, where you can do the on-chain transactions. They could be very expensive because it's gotten very popular and that drives up the cost of the gas when these projects are popular. Or layer twos, where they are more in charge of off-chain transactions and then sort of pinning to or um, the original layer one is the ultimate um, source of truth there. So these layer twos sit on top of layer ones. So, uh, and that, I think th this is the final concept we wanted to talk about a little bit, was just the concept of bridging and tokens. So, um, these things can get very complex. Bridges often can be a source of major vulnerabilities. <laughs> you might hear about, you know, quantities like $600 million being hacked, as an example, on some of these bridges. So a lot of these technologies um, can be newer. There's, and again, I said hundreds of layer one type protocols where um, bridges are being stood up. So um, those are often in the news. But that's another way really to, as a part of the broader concept of cross-chain interoperability, is thinking about how do you move tokens from one um, blockchain to another. And there's a lot of techniques to do that, which I think we won't, it's outside of the bounds of this um, discussion today, but atomic swaps, hash time lock contracts, etc. So with that, I would like to, um, I guess we're going to transition to talking about some of the use cases and the individual projects. So Shingo is going to uh, take over from here. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, the, so now the, it's a time to introduce to the each project in uh, belongs to the Hyperledger uh, the, under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundations. Uh, my name is Shingo Fujimoto from Fujitsu, and as uh, the introduced, uh, I was a former maintainer of the uh, the Hyperledger Cactus. But now the our uh, the project was uh, project name was uh, the brand new uh, one that was cacti that's a plural of the uh, the cactus in Japanese saboten is uh, uh, the meaning. So the uh, the cacti will provide to the some of the integration of the multiple blockchain. That is one uh, the approach of the uh, the uh, the choice of the, uh, the approach. So the, the, this uh, the diagram showing to the concept of the, how the cacti can be used in the real use cases, uh, that I intentionally using to the circular economy as a, because that is a common problem in the society. And 
the Sophia mentioned to the hybrid concept of the blockchain because of the blockchain has uh, cannot be private it's because of the blockchain is a kind of well the infrastructure for the other people to be participating. However, the the each company has their own domain for the to keep or to their governance inside of the their corporation site. So the, in this slide, uh, the, I was showing to the how the uh, the 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 CO2 emission will be uh, managed. So the uh, left to bottom side will be uh, creating to the values because of the uh, the Japanese government encouraged the companies to reduce to the CO2 emission with replace with the newer equipments. However, that actually cost. So the, that that cost will be helped by the another companies like uh, the airplanes because we do not have a currently have an efficient way to uh, the fly the jet uh, the fly the jet without the fuel. So the, those company wanted to reduce the CO2 emission, but they cannot. So the, instead, they are helping to the money to the those uh, the another company uh, uh, making the effort to reduce the actual uh, the CO2 emissions. And however, to the that is uh, only the between to the company's relationship. So the that uh, the the we need to the some sort of the proof is uh, the, the how they are contributing to the uh, the CO2 emission uh, the reductions. So the, that measured data will be uh, the up to the another uh, the systems, and that value will be uh, the, the go through the, uh, the another companies like uh, the how that they could uh, the contribute to the, uh, the systems. So this is an, uh, another uh, way of saying is a token economy. But uh, I think that that is one of the, uh, the use case of the, uh, the cacti as a solutions. So now the, I can see the, uh, the how the cacti is contributing for the integrating to the March blockchain into the single public chain battery. So the, as a next, I will to the system we will introduce another project, Yui. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shingo-san. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Susumu Toriyumi. Uh, I'm a VP of product at DataChain. And DataChain is a core contributor to a Hyperledger lab, UE. And UE focuses on achieving the trustless interoperability for heterogeneous uh, network of blockchain. And uh, this slide explains the uh, use case of UE. Uh, we worked with uh, Mitsubishi Trust Bank for uh, experimenting the delivery versus payment of the stable coins and security tokens. So on the left-hand side, uh, we have the uh, Progma coin platform, which is a, a issuing and maintaining platform for the stable coin. <coughs> and right-hand side, we have external uh, platform, which maintains the digital securities. And consider the scenario that uh, artists want to pay uh, both in a stable coin to receive the security token on the external platform. And we would like to make this kind of cross-chain transaction uh, in an atomic way. I mean, uh, the both transactions will succeed or both fails uh, to keep the consistency among the system. And <laughs> we will start this experiment uh, this year with e enterprise settings, but we will uh, continue to uh, connect to for example, public blockchain like Ethereum next year, so uh, we can make this uh, scenario hybrid blockchain space. Thank you. So I will hand up over to Sophia uh, to explain the Firefly use cases. Okay. Okay. So um, Hyperledger Firefly is another project under the Hyperledger community. And that's really looking at interoperability um, between the application and the ledger. So we, there's a rich connector framework, um, really, so you could bring any EVM-based chain or UTXO-based chain. And um, there's a lot of facilities there to help you, whether you're managing digital assets or transactions on and off uh, different blockchains. 
since we were going to focus on use cases, I gave a couple examples of uh, projects where, which are using Firefly. So I mentioned the gaming companies with NFTs for in-game assets, where you're going from private to public. Um, you know, examples where people may have started five years ago with a fabric-based supply chain for agricultural or commodities, but over time they've realized uh, they really want to layer tokens on top. And that can be to represent um, carbon credits in the ESG space, can be for loyalty points or other rewards for their suppliers. So Firefly makes it very easy to bring together Ethereum and Fabric um, chains and those sorts of use cases. There's other consortiums which are using uh, tokens and incentive mechanisms. That's healthcare to provide data accuracy and transfer value. Um, different Web3 startups. Um, so really looking at new ways of being able to finance uh, small and medium businesses create different types of ecosystems for trade finance. And then uh, another cool example of a project is one that actually um, Swift is running on Firefly where there's both Corda and Quorum ledgers available. There's 18 of the world's uh, uh, central banks and also global transaction banks who are currently live on that platform today. Swift, um, that was their Number one piece of exciting news, their chairman and CEO announced at Cybos about a month ago in Europe and included some logos. Um, you know, many of these companies are, you know, logos in the U.S. especially people would recognize, but I think also internationally um, of like production, enterprise deployments, which are, are using Firefly. And uh, I think what can you do with Firefly overall? I gave you some examples. But basically, it comes down to B2C, new digital experiences for your consumers, B2B, sort of modernizing the way multi-party um, actors work together in an ecosystem, and then just new business opportunities. And sometimes that could be, you start with B2B, for example, with a healthcare network, it's really looking at opening up data at a B2B insurance carrier, an insurance carrier. Uh, perspective, but then with an eye to making some of that transparency available to their end users. So if you go to a doctor's visit, um, not only can see if they're a network and they're taking new patients, but you're also going to know how much they will charge you. So that would be uh, very welcome in, in some parts of the world where we don't have as much transparency. And then I included a snapshot on the bottom right. You know, it's an open source project, but it has a very rich set of tools to accelerate development, um, over 500, 1,000 lines of code there, comes with a very rich UI, um, automate deployment, and then to very easily scale in production. So that's a quick highlight of Firefly. Well, thank you all for explaining your projects and giving everybody some background. Uh, so let's, uh, let's start asking questions. Uh, and please, you know, we'll make some time for audience questions. So if you have any questions as well, you know, please feel, please get them ready. So we are at an open source conference, obviously. So I wanted to ask you all what you thought the role of open source and open standards uh, is and will be with respect to interoperability. Uh, would you like to start? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I can be first. So the, uh, the, I think that the, uh, the blockchain, uh, the open source in the blockchain is very important since the the, uh, the blockchain is uh, well the uh, the decentralized mean to the uh, that all the trust is based on the community, not the single point of the uh, the players. So the, uh, the not only the uh, the simply I trust you, instead uh, that we better to trust to the code, and we need to be see the what they are doing in the uh, the behaviors. So the I think the uh, the open source and blockchain is a kind of perfect matching for the uh, the from that perspective, from my opinion. Okay, um, so I think one of the great aspect of the Hyperledger is that all, all the projects are open sourced. So Cacti, Firefly, and Lab UI are no, no exception. And you can browse all the source or detailed tutorials on the GitHub. So you can start uh, developing uh, right away. And speaking of Hyperledger Lab UI, 
Uh, it's based on the uh, inter-blockchain communication protocol. Uh, we call it IBC. And uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, we, that's provided from the Cosmos, the public blockchain ecosystem. And we will uh, uh, put more effort on the Cosmos uh, asset to make the, the trustless interoperability protocol in an enterprise domain. So we experienced uh, acceleration of the development uh, by using such kind of open standards and open source. And uh, as shingo san mentioned that the blockchain, basically blockchain is open source community. So yeah, that's the key concept and continue to be the key concept of the uh, community. Use this. I'll use this one, unless you. <laughs> um, all right. So I guess you can hear a couple themes. I mean, one is acceleration. So when there's uh, an open source code base, you have a community that's formed and maintainers and contributors that can move uh, quickly. Um, there's transparency. I will say what's important, maybe second part to the open source is how is it being governed? Where does the code sit? if it's just privately open sourced, which I, I do see in some areas of the Web3 space, someone could just flip those repos and make them private the next day, and then now you're building your business on something that it doesn't have the level of, of governance and assurance you would as if the code base sits in um, a well-managed, trusted community uh, that has decades of supporting enterprise. So, but certainly pretty important. Uh, we see governments, for example, as they're looking at Web3 and digital assets. You know, if the code base is proprietary, you know, what we've seen is they're not interested in adopting that as a standard. Uh, so certainly being able to see the code and then being able to contribute to it. If you're, um, you know, building something important on it, you want your developers to be able to interact with that community and meet your requirements. So that's what's great about these communities that form around the code bases. Awesome. Thanks for your excellent answers. Um, so next question. So sort of taking a longer term view, what do you think the long term view of you know, interoperability and integration is with respect to blockchain? Does anyone want to start? Yes. Start what, what, is, what is the long term <laughs> world? <laughs> Long term is a kind of difficult question so because of this field is quickly changed there every year. However, I think that uh, the, I believe that the interoperability is a collaboration. I think that that is my definition of the interoperability. Uh, doesn't matter that that is a securely integrated or uh, the logically integrated or uh, the collaboration is uh, always important for the blockchain world. Because of the, those, uh, the trust or uh, digital asset should be exchanged somehow. However, at the, uh, the, the same time, we have the several uh, news uh, reporting to the some crypto asset was stolen or such a thing. So the, I think the technical engineer need to be contribute to remove the, such a risk. Uh, to, that is, uh, uh, the, I think that that is our mission to uh, the, for the to, for the future of the interoperability. That is my personal opinion. Thank you. Um, uh, speaking from the public blockchain perspective, um, we have already uh, several dozens, if not hundred, uh, major public blockchains. Uh, one, of course, one of the uh, so sorry. The, the biggest one is, of course, Ethereum, but uh, other chains like Polygon or Avalanche shows a uh, very strong presence in the community. And uh, the interoperability like uh, token transfer is already in place and very important role in the DeFi context. So the, the panel title is the coming multi-chain world for me, the multi chain world already have come. And I, I think it will stay for say like five years from now. So interoperability is a key concept within such kind of such world. Okay. Um, well, I think we touched upon some of the directions the industry's going in the upfront, 
level set, so public and private convergence. Um, certainly, there's an emergence of certain standards. So you see Web3 skills are hard to find. And you know there's actually hundreds of new chains trying to get ecosystems formed. Um, so we've already seen some standardization like the EVM compatible chains, EVM type token standard based on the Ethereum virtual machine is the EVM. Um, so we expect to see more sort of consolidation of um, certain aspects so that people can get started quickly and then reuse and uh, take advantage of the skills in the industry. But um, certainly, I believe, although we do see a lot of enterprises doing uh, really interesting things with the technology and projects that are having an impact, I, I do believe we're still in the early days of um, a big transformation. And this is part of you know, post-COVID, people accelerating their digital transformation roadmaps. They're moving to the cloud. They're thinking about different ways of working with others in their industry and different ways of working, interacting with their consumers. So a lot of innovation. And, and typically when, you know, you have 30, 40-year-old legacy systems and you're doing that lift and shift to a new mission-critical system, you know, those stay in place for, for quite a while. So I think it is important uh, to make sure that when enterprises build, looking towards the future, that they're making really future-proof type choices with the code bases that they decide to platform on. And I think that's a lot of the consideration that all, all of us have here today with our respective communities. Awesome. I think those are great answers. Uh, would anyone in the audience like to ask one or all of our panelists a question? Hello. Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, since you mentioned interoperability being one of the upcoming priorities, so when enterprises you know, possibly reach out to you to consult, is interoperability a concern for them at all? Or is it something you guys mentioned they should be aware of? So I'm just curious on that part. Yeah, I guess if I start, I mean, on the Firefly side, I mentioned actual projects that people have brought to us. So, um, you know, Kaleido, it's the company I founded. We run a whole range of technologies and offer flexibility and choice. So it's really being more of a, you know, trusted advisor and offering them the options and that they're bringing their use case versus our forcing the issue on interoperability. There's certainly some times where it makes sense for someone if they're a solution provider and, and they're building an app basically like in the Web2 world now it's a decentralized or Web3 and has certain aspects including tokens to it that are different. You know, it, it might not need to interoperate with anything. It's just providing a service like the same way an app you'd subscribe to today. Um, and in other cases it does make a lot of sense to sort of maybe start in a more siloed manner and then um, when it makes sense to move in and out of that ecosystem. What, I'm curious to see what uh, Shingo and Susumu think. Okay, yeah, I think to the very similar to the concept of the uh, the Sophia mentioned, but the, uh, the 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 real problem in the uh, the real world is. Uh, uh, the, some people are not friendly as they expected. So the uh, the companies uh, the, do not want to expose to everything. So the I think that that, that is a kind of nature of the businesses. Uh, even that they can corroborate some part, uh, they cannot uh, uh, trust the whole things. So the I think that the, uh, the cacti is a kind of solution for the, that case where some sort of the uh, the well trust, partial trust, is will be united into the sim smaller. Uh, the community. Even that is a kind of very tiny uh, purpose, but that is uh, the more important to make it real uh, that for the blockchain as a workable solution. That is my perspective of the expectation for the Cacti project. So, uh, like two years ago, uh, when we uh, uh, selling our interoperability product to enterprise, the the concern or main target was the enterprise to enterprise interoperability. But nowadays, the 
enterprise to public blockchain. I mean, hybrid blockchain is uh, uh, very, uh, very, how to say, popular in, in the enterprise uh, domain. So in this, in this context, uh, it's very easy to explain the need of the, uh, such kind of uh, architecture because there is a, there is a several problems in decentralized finance, but uh, already $50 billion is locked in the DeFi space. So they would like to access such kind of uh, asset liquidity. So yeah, currently we, we are working with uh, mainly financial institution to tap into the public blockchain through the uh, enterprise blockchain. I, I'm gonna just add, I think it was a great question because a lot of times in Web3, you could see a hammer looking for a nail. The people just, you know, we're engineers and we think, well, how do these, you know, if you build this, how do you talk to that? And what's the natural extension five years down the road? But I, I do think it's important to just be grounded with real utility, real business value. <laughs> And that's um, a, good, a good reminder that that's what we're all here for. Awesome. We maybe have time for one more quick question, if anyone has one. <laughs> no one? Well, I guess I'll turn it over to the panelists. Do you all have any closing thoughts? The, uh, so I think that uh, well the uh, the in the very first of the first part of the explanation part of the interoperability parts so the I think that the many people thinking about the hybrid chain is important because of the we do not care about the public or private or consortium uh, the, that's the blockchains. So the interoperability technologies are try to resolve to the integrate to the those are more uh, nicely or smoothly. Uh, the the all the we had the three projects separately, but uh, we had uh, uh, taken a load of the different prospect or purposes, and we have the we are very willing or actually working together uh, the, to solve the different parts to fulfill the each other. So I think to the uh, the please watch to the uh, the all interoperability project in the Hyperledger Foundation because we are uh, the the always to the working together in the to uh, the to solve the common problem in the blockchain space. Okay. Okay. What the no. <laughs> oh, I, I, okay. Well, I guess my closing thought was just. To invite everyone to participate in any and all of these communities that uh, sound of interest. Uh, from a Hyperledger Firefly perspective, we do have monthly community calls, we have a Discord, we have different um, communities showcasing their work and sharing, which is, which is really great. And it's just so much easier to get started, build your Web3 app. So if you have an idea of something you want to do, uh, you've got all the tools to do that. So. Looking forward to seeing some of you guys on the Discord, guys and gals. Awesome, yeah, well, thank you all. Thank you, panelists, uh, especially. And uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you around. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to talk to us, any of us, or uh, Daniela in the front, or uh, Rai in the back, back there. Uh, and we can uh, help you with questions about Hyperledger and interoperability. So thank you all for your time, and thank you for coming.